Hi everyone, I'm Justisa and welcome to Dark History of Sweden. Today we will be talking about Sätomannen. I've already released two videos on Sato Asylum that you should check out if you like this one. And if you like true crime and serial killers, I have a few playlists on Swedish serial killers. Those will be linked in the description box and at the end of this video. Hope you enjoy. I did have a warning at the beginning of this video, but I do want to emphasize that this video will include talks of rape, molestation, abuse, and maltreatment of children. So if this disturbs you, you should not watch this video. Stay safe. Born Sture Bärvall, April 26, 1950 in Falun. He grew up with six siblings. One of them was his twin sister. Most of what we know about his early life is what he told his psychiatrist while being incarcerated. Unfortunately, he lied a lot. So much of what we know is most likely a lie. In the 60s, he started to sniff the solvent trichloroethylene, and his youth were characterized with sexual problems. Barival claimed that he had been sexually abused by his father at a young age, but later on changed it to his older sister. The inconsistencies made it difficult to believe him. He also claimed that he had been witness to his younger brother being killed and buried, but in a documentary he said that this was not true just as his siblings had always claimed. Something we do know, thanks to documentation, is that Barival, at 19 years old, started to work at Falun's hospital. This was where his crime record started. In 1969, he worked at Falun's hospital, and he was accused of raping four young boys that stayed there. The last one, he also choked, and they accused him of attempted murder. From 1992 until around 2002, he used the name Thomas Quick. And that is the name most of Sweden knew him by when they talked about him in news and media. In 1970, he was sentenced to institutional psychiatric care. And there was a discussion about whether he had pedophilia cum sadismus or if it, he was just a pedophile. In the end, they didn't think he actually tried to kill the boy, so they deemed him to be only a pedophile. This was when he came to Sato Mental Asylum. Here, Barival was diagnosed with persona immatura and antisocial personality disorder. He was to be treated for persona pathologica until 1977. In 1974, at the age of 23, Barival struck again and stabbed a man in Uppsala. This was while he technically still was under care at Sato, so he didn't get charged. And the prosecutor found it to be a failure of prosecution instead. By the end of the 80s, Barival himself resumed his conversational therapy at Sato Asylum because he had started to have relations with young boys and feared that he was losing control. After 16 years of hearing nothing about him, Barival was once again the suspect of a serious crime. December 16, 1990, he and a 16-year-old companion had together robbed and held a family hostage. They forced the father to take out 245,000 Swedish crowns, while threatening to kill his entire family, waving around with a knife. Barival even stabbed the bed while a child slept in it, to prove a point. 1991, Barival found himself at Sato Asylum once again. This time he was diagnosed with Dissociative Identity Disorder. A few years later, Barival was supposed to be declared healthy and move into an apartment just outside of Sato. But then, he started to confess. When it was revealed that he had DID and several alters, they started to medicate him with heavy medicines that made him very drowsy. 
This type of medication went on until 2001. During these 10 years, he was medicated and had daily therapy. This therapy was where he confessed to over 30 murders. These murders had taken place all over Sweden, Norway, Finland, and Denmark throughout the years 1964 and 1993. Some of the cases he confessed to were taken to court and he was in the end only found guilty in eight of the cases. We know since before that he had an affinity for lying and some of the stories he told about the murders didn't add up. In one case, he was supposedly 14 years old when he killed a boy the same age. The inconsistencies were many and he was high on medication at the time of most of the trials. Charles Selmanovitz. Charles was a 15-year-old boy who disappeared after a school dance 13th of November 1976 in Piteå. His remains weren't found until 19 September 1993. Barival confessed to his murder in spring 1994. There was no technical evidence connecting him to the murder. He didn't even have access to a car at this time. But his confession and the fact that he had claimed to have an accomplice who took his own life afterwards was evidence enough. Marinus and Jani Stegehus. The Dutch couple was found stabbed in their tent in Jellevare, July 13, 1984. Barival confessed just a short while after the Selmanovitz verdict. Once again, there was no technical evidence. But, in Barival's confession, there were things no one else could know. Once again, he had an accomplice that was unnamed. Johan Asklund Johan was an 11-year-old boy that disappeared from Sundsvall 7th of November 1980. This was the first murder Barival confessed to in 1992. He was sentenced for it on 21st of June 2001 but there was no technical evidence of his involvement. They sentenced him because he could leave information only a culprit would have known. Therese Johansen Therese was nine years old when she disappeared in Fjell in Norway on 3rd of July, 1988. No technical evidence, but his confession held information no one else but the culprit could have known. So, he was charged for this one as well. And this theme continues on. There is no technical evidence, but he claims to have murdered them and have more information than an innocent would have. The other murders he confessed to lacked both evidence and his information was not enough to convict him. So they dropped about 20 cases. It does kind of remind me of Henry Lee Lucas, who confessed to over 600 murders. There was a lot of controversy on the case of Thomas Quick, as Barival was known at the time. Several criminologists, lawyers, journalists questioned Barival's confessions. It seemed like an easy way out to pin all these murders and disappearances on a man who unknowingly confessed. In 2008, in a documentary, he stated that he had not committed any of the murders he was convicted for, and his lawyers said that they were going to appeal all the cases he had been sentenced for. And in 2013, all of them were granted, and he was exonerated of all charges. On 16th of April 2015, he was released from Satos Forensic Psychiatry, of which he himself announced on his Twitter. Today he lives a normal life in Duved, and on the summers he lives on Mallorca. There are still discussions about his lies, and if he truly is innocent. That was all I had on Satoman and Thomas Quick. Sture Bergvall. This was a crazy case that raises so many questions that I don't think we'll ever know the truth to. Bergvall did release a biography in 2016 telling his side, 
but who knows. Next week, I haven't decided on what I will talk about. So if you have a suggestion, comment down below and I will look into it. And don't forget to like, subscribe and hit that bell so you don't miss it. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Take care of each other and yourself. And I will see you guys in my next video. Bye.